Well, welcome everyone. Today's webinar, like all webinars, is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing through geodynamics.org. Yes, during, during the webinar, please use the chat window to type in your questions or communicate with others. During the Q&A session at the end of the talk, please either indicate in the chat window or turn on your microphone that you have a question. But again, during the webinar itself, please keep your microphones muted. For today's webinar, we are very fortunate to have Mark Gioso, who is the Vice President of OFM Research. Prior to his position at OFM Research, Mark was a professor at the University of Washington for many years, where he first developed the widely used computational tool MELTS, which enables calculations of chemical mass transfer in magmatic systems. Today, Mark will be discussing the Anki project, which is a collaborative web-based model configuration and testing portal that provides tools in computational thermodynamics and fluid dynamics. And with that, Mark, the screen is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very pleased that you've given me the opportunity here to talk about the Anki project with you. <clears throat> if you have any questions at all during the presentation, there's going to be a few demos. Just please send, send me a chat or interrupt me and I'll, I'll try to answer them. Um, the Anki project is, uh, a, a, as, as has been explained, is a, a modeling project. Where the, the objective is to um, meld various models and various modeling tools together in a, in a common uh, computational framework. And um, the word Anki, or the, the title of the project, comes from the Sumerian god Anki. And Enki is the god of languages and the god of creation in the Sumerian theology. And uh, we, uh, we adopted the, the name Enki for this project simply because uh, what we're attempting to do is sort of a comprehensive melding of models and techniques, uh, much as Enki did in the creation of the world. Um, why Enki? Why, why have we bothered to, uh, to undertake this, this problem at all? And it has to do with really the state of the art of modeling in um, the geosciences, particularly the, the geochemical part of, and petrological part of the geosciences. Um, the diagram that you see before you is a, and can everybody see the diagram? Everybody's okay? The diagram you see before you is, uh, is just an example of a cut through the crust and upper mantle of the Earth. And what I'm trying to show on this diagram are some of the geochemical models that we used to describe various aspects of the properties and fluid flow and dynamical evolution of the system. Um, and many of you will be familiar with some of these, these models. We've, I've just mentioned um, MELTS, the MELTS model which I can't seem to have my pointer with me here. But, ah, here we go, here we go. No? Well, I can't see the pointer anymore. But you'll have to look at the screen. The, um, the MELTS model, which is indicated there, is a thermodynamic model which is used to calculate um, the chemical evolution of igneous systems, solid liquid equilibria in igneous systems. Um, the model Purple X, which many of you will have seen, or the model Thermal Calc, is another example of a thermodynamic model used to calculate phase equilibria, in this case, for metamorphic systems. There are other thermodynamic models in this diagram. There's EQ6 and HKF, which are models which are used in the aqueous uh, sciences to calculate the effects of water-rock interaction, fluids and rock, um, and how they interact. For some reason, my uh, Something wrong? Oh, uh, then, then there's the, um, uh, the melts plus dew model, which is used to calculate the consequences of magmas interacting with aqueous fluids, and so on and so forth. There's a wide variety of models on here. And then there are fluid dynamical models like Aspect, which everyone in this group is familiar with, and Terra Firma, which is um, a model for uh, fluid dynamical evolution that Mark uh, Spiegelman is, is working with. The reason I have all these models up here is, is, is the following. All of these models are based on data, on thermodynamic data model collections, which are essentially independent of each other. And most importantly, inconsistent thermodynamically with each other. As an example, MELTS is built on a completely internally consistent thermodynamic data model collection, which is unique to just MELTS. 
EQ3, EQ6, SUPCRIT, these aqueous solution codes, those are based on thermodynamic data model collections that have nothing to do with the ones in melts. Purple X is often used by, by wide variety of modelers in this community, and yet you can put whatever data you want into Purple X to do your calculations. No requirement of internal consistency. The models of thermal calc from Holland and Powell and Lars Stixrud's models are also internally consistent but isolated. And as, as, as sure as most of you know, when you go to run a fluid dynamical simulation, usually the criteria is whatever property model runs faster is the one that I'm going to use. Because to do a complete thermodynamic minimization as part of the fluid dynamic simulation is computationally prohibitive and just not cost effective. So you have this disparity in the kinds of data that goes into all these models. So if you're asking these models to talk to each other, you have a real problem. You have to somehow make them internally consistent. And the problem there, or the, and the, the um, situation as it exists right now is that there is no support infrastructure. There's no modeling framework to allow you to adjust the thermodynamic models or the properties models that go into these various structures. And on top of that, there's no comprehensive way of visualizing results of these models. So we have a situation that is really, um, it makes the whole modeling procedure very, very difficult. And it makes, uh, it makes the ability to combine models from various sources almost impossible. So what did we do? We decided to, to, to attack this problem of inconsistency of various formulations with the Enki project. And the Enki project is, uh, is one where we have created a standardized interface to all of the existing models and a standardized software interface for building uh, and recalibrating the existing models to make them internally consistent with each other. So the Yankee uh, uh, project involves creating the fundamental or, or building the fundamental data resources for updating and maintaining the various models that go into these modeling packages, building a calibration framework for updating and documenting the models, and then uh, creating a, a, a sort of a comprehensive um, visualization framework for looking at the results of these models. Now, of course, we haven't achieved all aspects of this project with Enki, but I want to talk today about some of the things that we have been able to do and, and how we've been able to implement that. So um, the first thing is, what, what, how, how are we trying to describe, how are we trying to create this, this comprehensive modeling environment? We've chosen Jupyter Notebooks as an access platform for the underlying software infrastructure. And we then uh, created a standardized API for all of the existing coded models of thermodynamic properties that can be accessed through these, these Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and we've created standardized API for accessing the underlying database of properties that, uh, that support the model creation. Now, this is really, really important because for the first time, we now have the ability to look at uh, or to examine various calibrated thermodynamic databases and compare them to each other. Up until now, there really has not been a way to do this unless you code them all up yourself. Um, the major coding uh, language that we were using in Enki at the high level is Python. So the access to the databases can be done in Python through Jupyter Notebooks. But the underlying computations are done in a wide variety of languages uh, for speed purposes. Um, what, what really Enki is trying to address is, as I said already, this idea of interoperability of models, the ability to update models, to access and distribute them, and to document reproducible workflows. And I think that's really, really important. There are too many papers that appear in the literature that, um, that, that essentially document the results of modeling without the ability to actually reproduce in detail how that modeling was done. And Enki is trying to address some of this. 
Um, the other thing that it's trying to do is to um, remove the dependence of the community, and this is particularly so of the geochemical and petrological community. It's trying to remove their dependence on apps. Most of the most of the researchers in in that community use existing pieces of software that do very specific things, like melts, for example, and uh, perform their their research activity using these modeling tools within the scope of the tool, and do not try to go outside of the capabilities of that tool. Perhaps the worst possible case of this is the incredible dependence of the geochemical community on Excel. And there are many geochemists who, if you can't do the modeling in Excel, we're not going to do the modeling at all. And that's really quite sad because it does limit the kinds of things that can be done. So uh, Enki is trying to, to get out of this by creating a standardized API for the software libraries and encourage people to actually learn a little bit of Python and go in and access the, the tools directly and build the application or build the modeling tool that you're, you're, you're interested in using, not the modeling tool that is simply available. We're also in Enki trying to encourage some synthesis science, and that's a goal that, that lots of people have. Um, what's currently in the Enki package? The Enki Python package, which is freely available on GitLab, it's open source, it has a number of modules. It has a module that's uh, built to uh, facilitate the calibration of thermodynamic models and other sort of property measurements. That module is called Calibrate. It has a module called Coder, which is built to actually construct a fast code from scratch and use that then in the as a, as a modeling tool, either integrate that into existing thermodynamic databases or integrate that into existing fluid dynamical simulations. And I'll show you a demo of that in a second. It has some core facilities to do basic chemical transformations. It has a new module to, um, to uh, allow equilibrium calculations to be done using a generic equilibrium calculators. I won't have time to show you this today, but we can now do equilibrium calculations in both closed and open systems. And uh, for petrological applications, the open system calculations are, are particularly interesting and important. We can, we can talk about that after in the, in the question sessions if, you, if you'd like. There are uh, modules in the Python uh, package to do um, database loading and database analysis and for accessing thermodynamic properties of all the phases. Right now, the Enki package contains the thermodynamic database of uh, Berman and Holland and Powell and sticks through Lithgow Bertoloni. Berman is uh, aimed at low pressure uh, phase equilibrium. Holland and Powell is slightly higher pressure, including the lower mantle and has a wide variety of, of, of mineral solid solutions involved. The database of Stixrud and lithgow Bertoloni uh, is aimed at calculating phase equilibria in, at very high pressures, uh, particularly in the, in the Earth's mantle all the way down to the core and, and other high pressure bodies. The uh, Enki currently also contains the DO, the Deep Earth Water Model, uh, which is a model of aqueous fluids up to pressures of about eight or 10 GPA. And it contains the Helgus and Kirkham flowers and extension uh, aqueous ion and complex model for uh, water rock interaction at uh, crustal sorts of, of temperatures and pressures. Uh, Enki also contains SWIM, which is our new standard water integrated model that calculates the properties of water over the entire pressure temperature range of application for the, uh, for the Earth. And then it also contains um, melts in, in all its varieties and our new uh, combined melts plus do model that allows you to look at the partitioning of aqueous fluids uh, from magmatic systems and vice versa. So just to give you a sense of this, I'd like to do uh, a little demo here and um, show you what uh, just, uh, I can't possibly do everything that's in, in Enki, but I can give you a taste for the sort 
of, of uh, ways in which you interact with the package. Um, I'm going here to a server called uh, enki.ofmresearch.org, which is the main Enki server. The uh, Enki is, is, of course, still in development, and we will move probably by the end of next year, um, or this time next year, we will move the uh, Enki platform from a single server to the cloud so that you can um, access it on demand using uh, cloud-based resources of your own, of your own uh, designation. But uh, let me uh, log into the server here. I'm gonna log in as myself. Um, and once we get access, go through the splash screen. What we're here, and I'm sure most of you will recognize this as a, a Jupyter environment. This happens to be Jupyter Lab, and Jupyter Lab is the front end that we're using for Enki. When you uh, log in, you have your own uh, working space, of course, and then you have access to uh, the Enki tab, which is the uh, uh, publicly access uh, notebooks and documentation for the, uh, for the Enki server. And um, I'm going to uh, just bring your attention to the public notebook section. In the public notebook section, we have a wide variety of uh, of uh, folders that contain notebooks that are accessible uh, to demonstrate various aspects of the Enki project. If anyone uh, would like access to the Enki server, uh, just send me just send me an email, and I can set up access to it. You can't you can't get access automatically at this stage because we are still working on the environment, but. Uh, just send me an email at giorso at ofmresearch.org and, um, and I'll, I'll set you up and you can take a look yourself. The uh, notebooks that um, I'm going to access just to show you what's, what, how Enki behaves are in the uh, pure phases folder here. You can just click on that and you get access to a wide variety of Python notebooks, uh, Jupyter notebooks that, um, that demonstrate various aspects. So I'm going to demonstrate um, uh, some uh, capabilities in the pure phases section and in the code gen or coder section. And what I've done with these notebooks is I've just um, copied them from the public area and put them over here into my own private space so I can run them and make modifications to them and, uh, and show you what's going on. Let me just uh, double click on this notebook called Compare Stoichiometric Phases. And this was going to give you a, a good idea of the sorts of properties calculations that you can do using the, the Enki uh, framework. And again, you access the basic API with Python. You can also do it from R if you prefer to, to use R as a language, but we mostly use Python. And if you've never seen a Jupyter Notebook before, Jupyter Notebooks, of course, are a way of executing Python in code cells and then documenting what's going on in markdown cells. So these notebooks all have some degree of documentation and code generation. You execute a notebook by, by clicking in the first cell and holding down the shift key and hitting a return. That just executed a, a documentation cell, so nothing happened. Hitting the return again now will actually bring in some Python software and will also bring in the uh, parts of the Thermo Engine or Enki package that I want to use. In this case, the phases module and the model module. Can everybody see? This, this okay? I get one nod, so okay. I'll just assume that everyone can see it. Um, the, to access the existing underlying thermodynamic databases is really quite simple in Anki. Um, you just specify the database and say, give me access to all the minerals and all the properties in that database. So in this line here, for example, uh, all I'm doing is um, accessing the default database, which is Berman, and loading it into this model structure. Here I'm accessing Sixroot, here I'm accessing Holland and Powell. And so with a single shift return, we now have access to all the thermodynamic properties and all the calculational schemes that allow you to calculate any thermodynamic property from any of those databases. So um, what I'm going to do, just go through this and show you, what I'm going to do is pull the properties of quartz from all three of those databases. Now, quartz is a very common mineral. 
And you would expect that the properties of quartz are going to be pretty consistent between any known thermodynamic database. At least that would be my expectation. Let's actually see if that's correct. And again, for the first time you can do this in an Enki notebook, an Enki Jupyter notebook, beforehand you would have to, to, to calibrate all of this yourself or calibrate, you would have to um, program all of this up yourself, write the functions, it would take you a long time. Here we can just with a few keystrokes figure out what's going on. Let's just do something very, very simple. Let's calculate what the heat capacity of quartz looks like as a function of temperature at one bar. And in the process of that, plot it along with some data on the heat capacity that I happen to have stored in a file, which is sitting on the disk next to this. So with a single return, we, I, I've, we've gone through and we called the Enki API on each of those three databases. It's calculated the heat capacity from the thermodynamic models that are being interrogated. It's plotted them and it's plotted up the actual data involved here. Now, let me just blow this up a little bit because I know you're going to be, because uh, I know you're going to be hard pressed to see it. Let me just zoom in a little bit here. This better for people? Yep, that's yes. great. Good. And, and you can see the data here are in green. The model of Berman is in red. The model of Holland and Powell is in yellow, which sits essentially on top of Berman. The model of Sticks root here is in blue. And you can see that for the heat capacity of quartz at one bar, not all thermodynamic models are created equal. That's important to know. And in fact, we could go through and we could do this for any of the thermodynamic properties. We can do this, for example, for the entropy by just calling the entropy functions rather than the heat capacity functions and again plot them up and compare them. And you can see in this case, the thermodynamic properties calculated from Berman are exactly correct with the measured entropy at one, at one bar and 298. Whereas the thermodynamic properties from Holland and Powell and Stixrud are not. Now, why is this the case? That's, that's something that we could get into and talk about, but it has to do with the fact that not all thermodynamic databases are created to do every problem. The Berman database was created to be able to reproduce these low temperature, low pressure data. The Stickstrew database was not. The Stickstrew database was only created to work above one GPA. The Holland and Powell database was optimized to do other things. And so we have a way here of just looking at them all. But my point in showing you this is simply that it's possible to calculate thermodynamic properties rapidly for any of these databases using the Yankee protocol. And um, and it, and it works quite well. So let me give you one more example before we go back to the slides, just to give you a sense of how you can use a very complex thermodynamic model with Enki. And uh, let's do melts, since many of you are, are familiar with melts, or many of you would be, will be familiar with melts. Um, let me click on the melts notebook. There are many, many melts notebooks in our collections. This happens to be one that does the model P melts. And P melts is a high pressure or higher pressure liquid solid phase equilibrium model for, for calculating, for example, the way the Earth's mantle melts or the way the mantle of terrestrial planets would melt. It simply allows you to specify a temperature and pressure, calculate the phase equilibrium, including the amount of liquid present, and then determine the compositions of all the phases um, that represent the equilibrium assemblage. To run melts in the Enki framework is, again, pretty simple with just a little bit of Python. Here, we just execute a cell that brings in some standard uh, uh, Python packages, as well as the equilibrate package of Enki. And the equilibrate package contains the, uh, the melts models, the equilibrium models that implement melts. Uh, here, we invoke and create an instance of a melts model for version 5.6.1, which is pmelts, which is this mantle melting model. And here, we simply get some information about oxides and phases in the system. 
Then we specify the bulk composition of the system. In this case, it's a peritone, a typical mantle uh, bulk composition for the earth. And then we just set up the calculation. We say, yes, we want to include various phases. We can select them one by one. And then once that's done, the single command melts equilibrate with specified temperature and pressure will actually execute a melts calculation, and there's the output of that melts calculation. So this will be the equilibrium phase assemblage at temperature and pressure. Now you can see that's just a Python call, right? So if you have some complicated modeling scenario that you want to build uh, using this Enki framework, you can simply wrap that Python code call in whatever, whatever you want to do and calculate the properties uh, sequentially. So, I mean, you could, for example, wrap that Python call to create a grid of output and then interrogate that grid everywhere, pressure temperature grid, let's say, to see what the properties of the system are. And that might be a good input grid for calculations of materials properties for some dynamical calculation that you're trying to do. But um, let's do something interesting with this. We've just calculated these, these the properties, the phases in the system at known temperature and pressure. Since this is a thermodynamic model, we can extract at that temperature and pressure with that known phase assemblage the total entropy of the system. And not only that, we can then tell Enki that I want to run the simulation at whatever entropy I tell it and whatever pressure I tell it. Now that's a, that's a thermodynamic equilibrium which is calculated by minimizing the enthalpy of the system rather than the Gibbs free energy. And we can do that with the Yankee package. We can minimize the enthalpy, the Helmholtz energy, the internal energy, or the Gibbs free energy and calculate the consequences of that. So if I do that, I just get back, I put in the entropy, that I, that I just calculated, so I get back exactly the same assemblage. But now, what can we do? Now we can say, okay, let's examine the process of adiabatic melting in the mantle. Adiabatic melting is a process which takes place at constant entropy. So now let us hold the entropy constant, and let us change the pressure and calculate what the phase assemblage is. And this little block of code here, it may look very, very complicated, but basically it's all plotting code. There's only one little bit of code in here that actually does the calculation. It's right in here. Oh, you can see my, my mouse here now. It's right in here. We're just holding the entropy constant because the entropy increment is zero. We're allowing the pressure to change. And if I execute this, block of code right here. It will do melts calculations at a whole series of different pressures from uh, one GPA all the way down to uh, 100 MPA. And uh, as it does the calculation at all these pressures, it's holding the entropy of the system constant. It's doing an adiabatic melting calculation and actually calculating the amount of liquid which is produced and the change in the solid assemblage. And also calculating the dependent variable in this case, which is temperature. We're holding entropy constant, temperature is dependent, it's determined by the adiabatic gradient, and the solid black curve here is the adiabatic calculated temperature read from this axis, and you can see that it differs quite a bit from the uh, standard temperature decrease that you might expect going up along an ice, a geotherm. And of course, the reason the adiabatic temperature is different from the geotherm has to do with the fact that there's changing phase proportions and there's phase equilibria uh, transitions going on as you move up the gradient. But the details of that are, are, are more interesting to the petrologist. But what I think, uh, what I want you to gather from this is that you can, with the Yankee package, do some very, very complicated, 
um, and sophisticated modeling, all within the context of these Jupyter notebooks. And it is is pretty easy to access them, get at the data, plot the various quantities, and so on and so forth. All right, that's my that's my first demo. What I want to do is go back to uh, the uh, the slides, and this is the slide that I showed before, but. What I'd like to focus on just a little bit is, um, is this module here called Coder, which is part of the Yankee package. And Coder is an interesting module because it allows you to actually create um, thermodynamic models or property models from scratch and then automatically generate computer code that implements those models. And then you can use that computer code any way you want. You can read it back into the thermodynamic equilibrium property generator, or as, as I, my colleague Mark Spiegelman is doing, you can take that generated computer code and feed it into um, dynamical models and use it to calculate the properties that are necessary in the dynamical simulation. So um, why is this necessary? Right. Well, let me let me give you let me just take a diversion here. Let me let me tell you a little bit about how difficult it is to actually construct thermodynamic models that describe realistic properties of minerals and melts and gases and so on and so forth. What you what you have to do to do that process is you have to generate some theory. You have to do all of the necessary algebra and calculus to actually implement the various thermodynamic properties you're interested in from that theory. You have to code that up. You have to calibrate the model. Usually you have to start over again once you do calibration. You have to create more code in order to do the application and so on and so forth. How long does this process typically take? This process takes a long time for a typical thermodynamic model. If we were to look at, for example, generating a new thermodynamic model for garnets that's applicable for the Earth, this whole process from here to here might take a year of someone's time. And that's a long time. And a great a deal of that time is spent in the various coding aspects of that and checking the code and making sure that these, these long, elaborate thermodynamic models are actually coded correctly and are self-consistent. So the coder module of Enki is meant to address this aspect and this aspect of the problem and to eliminate this I'm sorry? Ah, and to eliminate this aspect of the problem. Am I running out of time? Okay. Um, and so let's, let me give you an example of that. And we're going to go back to the demo again, because um, I think the easiest way to describe it is to simply show you. So let me look at um, a, the whole process of constructing a thermodynamic model for properties of something. Let's say we're trying to create a thermodynamic model to describe the properties of some solid phase, and it's going to have a formulation for the heat capacity, it's going to have a formulation for the equation of state, it's going to need the thermodynamic properties that reference temperature and pressure, and we want to implement that model. So let's do a simple, thermodynamic model construction. We have a notebook here that will do that for the Berman standard state code with birch bernahan equation of state. So what does that mean? Well, I'm going to read in all this standard Python stuff. And I'm going to say, OK, we're going to implement a model for the heat capacity, which looks like that. Right? It's a simple formulation, a Berman-like formulation for the heat capacity. But we're going to do it symbolically. We're going to use this package called SymPy in Python. And that will symbolically generate an equation for the heat capacity. Now, I've just pieced through this. But let me just show you what I've done so far. I'm going to create a new cell here and just print out what the heat capacity looks like at one bar. There it is. So I've symbolically created the Berman heat capacity expression. Now I'm going to use, not by hand, I'm not going to do the calculus by hand, I'm going to use the, the coder package to symbolically integrate that heat capacity and create an expression for the enthalpy of the system 
and the entropy of the system. And I'm going to do it with a single command like that and just print out the resulting symbolic expression. Now, this saves a lot of time, as you can imagine. And we can do this for all the various aspects of the problem. We can create this thermodynamic model for the solid phase. And uh, when we do that, we're going to get um, various expressions for all the various terms. So, for example, this is the expression for the equation of state that needs to be solved. We can go through and we can create an expression for the Helmholtz energy that needs to be solved. And it's taking the, the machine a little bit of time to do it, but there it is. There's the Helmholtz expression consistent with birch bernahan theory, consistent with the heat capacity of Burma. And finally, we can construct from the Helmholtz energy the final expression for the Gibbs free energy of the phase. All right? Now think about having to sit there and, um, and compile this to write a computer program that actually implements this Gibbs energy function. And then think about all the problems you would have if you then said, okay, given this function now, what is the heat capacity at pressure? What is the compressibility? What's the bulk modulus look like? What is the derivative of the bulk modulus look like? This is driving nuts. You're gonna be there for days and days and days doing the calculus, doing the algebra, checking it, and then you have to program it. Well, watch. With this single command next, I'm going to load that Gibbs energy function and the birch murnahan solution that has to be solved into the model. At this point, then, I'm going to name the model. I'm going to uh, just do some housekeeping, create a working directory to develop the model. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to say I want to create the fastest model possible. And now I'm going to load some parameters into this, uh, this model that specify the values of the heat capacity coefficients or the equation of state coefficients or whatever you want to do. I just happen to have those, those numbers uh, loaded from uh, some uh, offline database, but you could, you could put them in here if you wished. So there you go. And um, now what's it doing? I hit a return. Notice that it's this, there was this line here that said result equals model that create code module. What it's doing right now is it is actually creating all of the underlying code in C that implements this model. And we can go to the disk here and actually look at that. We can go into the working directory where it just wrote this. It says it wrote it seconds ago, so I believe them. We can double click on this and we can look at that code. And here is an example of this. It just made this. It took that model that you just created and it made this. And it made a code that can calculate the Gibbs energy, the entropy, the volume, so on and so forth, all the thermodynamic properties you could ever imagine. All this has been done automatically and checked, so you never have to check the code. And I realize that it's human readable, not human readable, but who cares, because you can do it on demand. And now we can take this code, uh, and let's see, where are we here? We can take this code, that we've just created, and we can now uh, reload it back into the notebook with an importation of the module that's just created. And once that code is reloaded back into the notebook, then I can actually use it. So for example, I can call from that module now that I just created all of the properties that I that I that we just made and we can also calculate all the thermodynamic properties um, on demand. So here I've just made a list of all the thermodynamic properties that are consistent with that Gibbs energy expression and they've just come back. The really amazing thing and I think the important thing for um, for you guys that are that are interested in 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 uh, fluid dynamical uh, uh, modeling and in doing this sort of modeling is that 
the code that's produced is very, very fast. If I were to hand code what I just did and create a, a human readable piece of code that, um, uh, that we could maintain and update and so on and so forth, I could probably get that piece of code to execute in about maybe 30 or 40 milliseconds on a gigahertz processor in order to calculate the thermodynamic, the Gibbs energy, let's say, of the phase. I'm going to time the code that's just been generated here. And that's 360 nanoseconds to actually calculate the Gibbs energy of the system. That is unbelievably fast. And the reason it's so fast is that this human unreadable code has been taken in by the compiler, in this case, Clang. Direct substitution has been made for all of the constants in the expression. The expression has been simplified. There are no longer any if blocks. There are no longer any switch statements. Everything has been simplified down so that the actual execution time can be enormously fast. So I think that is probably one of the most interesting uh, consequences of the Enki project. We did not know when we started this project that we would be able to uh, uh, actually generate uh, extremely fast code on the fly in this fashion. And the reason we didn't know is that the underlying Python packages like SymPy were not fully developed when we first wrote the proposals and, and, and started to do this work. But now, uh, in, the, in the course of, of, of working on the project, all these tools have become available. And now we're actually able to, uh, to utilize them and to create an environment that is really, really quite, quite, quite nice as a modeling environment. So let me go back to the, uh, this, this issue again. And, and, and I'm trying to, trying to tell you that um, with, this, with this Enki project, we can streamline a lot of the aspects of, of modeling. And um, we can make it so that more sophisticated property models can be used in um, uh, code like dynamical codes that in the past, have been sort of rate limited because the ability to actually calculate the property using a real thermodynamic model was just so uh, time consuming that you really didn't want to do that and you made approximations as to, as to, to do something else uh, as an alternative. But now we're at the point where we can actually do realistic property calculations like, like, uh, like melt calculations, like um, uh, uh, heat capacities and entropies and enthalpies and Gibbs energies and phase stability calculations in very, very fast and, um, and facilitate this integration. And we've also done, done it in a way that allows um, uh, multiple different model types to be integrated using these common APIs. Um, in the in this in the Jupyter Notebook framework. Now, of course, if you don't like Jupyter Notebooks, as my as my colleague Mark Spiegelman hates Jupyter Notebooks, well, just don't use Jupyter Notebooks, right? Use Python scripts directly, or simply generate the code and go and call the code directly. So uh, Mark's group is uh, taking the, the generated C code and wrapping it in C++ and then feeding the C++ into the, uh, the calculations that they want to do. Now, I'm, I'm just about out of time here. I had one more thing that I, that I, was, I was going to talk about, but um, let me, let me just, just gloss over this and mention it because I think it's kind of important. It's also arisen out of the Enki project. Um, and then we can, we can go to questions, and I won't take more than a minute on this. Well, one of the things that we, we, we encounter in working with Enki and in thinking about these sorts of problems is that the way we publish modeling uh, exercises is really woefully inadequate. I mean, the average paper that we publish nowadays looks at results of modeling exercises, but really does not allow you to uh, completely reproduce the model that's published. Um, and, uh, and part of that has to do with the fact that software evolves independently of the publishing process. Part of that has to do with the fact that you can't possibly publish all the bits and pieces in order to, to, to have a replicable model. But, um, 
we have a, 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 a solution to this, which we have not implemented, but we're really interested in, in talking about. And I remember having very, very lengthy and, and, and uh, uh, nice discussions with Louise Kellogg about this because she was a great component of having uh, uh, a better method of, publish, uh, of publishing uh, reproducible and replicable science this way. But um, we're thinking of actually um, developing this for Enki uh, as a prototype. And uh, the American Geophysical Union has actually been, uh, uh, is pursuing this and may not adopt this very model, but is going to try to implement something quite similar to this uh, for G cubed. And the idea is to have a, a modeling paper that depends on uh, the data resources and system software and custom software like Enki, all part all coupled to a Jupyter notebook, which becomes the paper itself, and then to package the entire Jupyter notebook or notebooks uh, collection in a Docker container that can be instantiated in the cloud so that the idea of publishing a paper it becomes one of, um, of uh, examining a static version of the Jupyter notebook and then uh, transparently allowing that uh, collection of data and software and and notebooks to be instantiated in the cloud and executed so that the entire package can indeed be uh, reproducible. And of course, the nice thing about that is the, the extension to this is that, well, then if you, can, if you can reproduce the existing analysis, then perhaps you can take the published paper and you can modify it and build your own paper on top of it. So this whole notion of cloning the container, instantiating it in your own uh, uh, laptop or desktop or, or cloud system and then modifying it and developing a derivative paper that's based upon it is uh, this notion that we're trying to uh, push uh, with with Enki because we realize that once people begin to use this package extensively in their research they're going to want to publish with it and there's no sense publishing a static paper independent of the software because then what's the use, right? You need to publish a paper that can actually reproduce what it is you're trying to describe. And uh, we think a model like this is one that, that might be useful for that. Well, thank you very much. I hope the, the, this overview of Enki is something that you found interesting and, and perhaps useful. Great. Thank you, Mark. And we now have about 10 minutes for questions, everyone. So feel free to type them into the chat window or to unmute and then just ask directly. Uh, so we have, we have a question already. So in the publishing model, how does licensing and copyright work? Very, very good question. Who owns the copyright? If I can modify the notebook, then what does that imply about licensing? I think that's an excellent question. And, and being naive about most of these things, I haven't worked through the details of that. But the people at the AGU are, are thinking about it. And the idea is to, um, at first, uh, launch this as, a, as an open source um, uh, uh, publication. Um, but the trick is, of course, is to give people credit. So the, 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 the notion of, um, of just releasing something like this and then allowing anybody to use it for any purpose and not, and not pull credit along with it is really important. So I think some mechanism has to be developed to sign the notebooks uh, to allow modification um, to the notebook as long as you carry along the original to uh, somehow make the publishing of the final product contingent upon a uh, sort of a, a blockchain-like access through the entire history of the, of the uh, development. Um, those sorts of details I haven't, I haven't uh, thought about in sufficient detail to really answer that question. As someone who is not a geochemist, but is interested in coupling portions of the Yankee package with codes like Aspect, where would be the best place to start? Um, is working 
through all the examples and tutorials on the Enki website a reasonable starting point. Well, that certainly would be a, a first uh, starting point. But what I would also do is I would have, uh, I would initiate a discussion with Julianne, uh, Juliana Danberg, um, because she is actually interested in doing this and is part of the Enki user group. And she's been uh, uh, interested in the beginning in developing some method of using Enki to calculate materials properties as part of the aspect uh, code. Um, but, but having said that, if, if, you're, if, you, if you want to pursue this, I would first start with the examples on, on, the, on the server and, and, and look at some of the um, uh, coupling examples that, uh, that Mark Spiegelman and his group have, uh, have talked about. Um, and then uh, I would join the Anki user group and come to one of our workshops. So uh, there's a workshop um, for the for the Anki community that's going to be held at the Goldschmidt conference uh, this summer. Uh, there's going to be another one uh, in in Europe later on in September. We have a, an Anki uh, user group conference uh, in the beginning of August. Uh, in Colorado, uh, and uh, we plan uh, additional workshops in the next year. So uh, the, I think the best thing to do if you're really serious about this would be to uh, contact me and, uh, and we'll see if, if uh, we have the resources to, for you to attend one of the workshops, and then you'll be around a, a user community that is, uh, that is really interested in, in doing this sort of work, and you can see what some of the challenges would be and where we are at present and, uh, and, and play around. And Juliana is happy to talk to everybody about it, which is great. <laughs> More questions, anyone? Do you, do you think this coding stuff is cool? I, I really, I really think the code generation stuff is really cool. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I, on a personal level, I'm still trying to wrap my head on, on, on the workflow process of going from something like using aspect to then generating code and then coupling that in. It's incredible. It's incredibly powerful, but, it, but yeah, it's, it, it, it's still very different workflow than many people are probably used to. Yeah. So I'll tell you what Mark Spiegelman is doing with Terra Firma. Um, he's got a, um, he has a, so he, go, he, he uses the uh, Jupyter Notebook paradigm, right, to actually formulate the properties of, of what he's interested in. So it could be a standard model that exists already, like, you know, the Berman model, or it could be Stixrude, or it could be, um, it could be some new model for some system that he's interested in. Uh, he and uh, Lucy Tweed, for example, are really interested in um, trying to do phase equilibria in MGO SiO2 water. Well, uh, you you can you can with this with this Jupyter notebook and with this coder package you can formulate a solution model to describe the properties of uh, of liquids um, in that system and of the solid phases in that system. So then from the notebook you can generate the code the C code that's necessary to implement all the thermodynamic properties that you might need. And then um, a market and students have scripts that automatically take that C code and generate it from that, uh, from that uh, C++ calls to the C code and then uh, automatically integrate that, the, those C++ calls into the, um, the Terraformer framework. So that, uh, and so that when they're compiled into a module, a Terra Firma knows how to call them. And he uses various uh, configuration packages that are specific to Terra Firma. But in principle, um, the most straightforward way to do this would be to um, use the notebooks to formulate the models that you require, and then use the coder uh, module in Enki to generate C code. 
and then take that C code and, and, and wrap it by hand in C++ or perhaps just use it directly from Aspect. And, um, and then that would be a way of, 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 of using Anki to support the kind of material properties uh, calculations that you need for the Aspect code. If we were to wrap, if we were to directly call some of the C packages from Aspect, would you suggest publishing those C files along with the paper? Or absolutely, like, absolutely, yeah. yes, yes, absolutely. In fact, what I would suggest you do is not only publish the generated C files, I would suggest you publish the Jupyter notebook that generated those C files. So then you have the complete workflow, right? Then people know exactly what you did and what you assumed to construct the thermodynamic formulation. They know how you parameterized it. Then they have the, the code itself that they might want to use that's generated. And then they have, of course, um, the results of the aspect calculation. But that way, all parts of the problem are, uh, are available. And again, if you publish if you, if you uh, publish the notebook that did that, which is based on Enki, you can hope that the, the, as Enki evolves, it remains internally consistent with that notebook, right? Yeah. Or you can do what I suggest, which is not only publish the notebook, but publish also the the static snapshot of the Anki software, or at least link to it, at least link to the um, the Git um, signature, right, for that stage of the repository, so that you could go back and actually reproduce the whole thing from scratch. And and the all the Anki code is open source. It's available not on GitHub, but it's available on GitLab. And if anyone um, uh, would like be, would like to be pointed to it or would like access to it, again, don't hesitate to um, to notify me. I say it's open source, but it, but and and it will be fully available at the close of the project. But right now, it is it is open, but it's open to the restricted user community. So, uh, but I I'm happy to make anybody that I know. A member of the user community. So just just send me an email again, and I can uh, I can help you with that. Any final questions, anyone? We have about one or two minutes left. Oh, thank you very much. Sarah said that she enjoyed it. <laughs> well. If there are no final questions, thank you again, Mark. This was absolutely fantastic. It's going to be exciting to see. It's really exciting to see how people are going to use this down the line in the next few years. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm really. This is this is one of the things that I'm really really excited about. So uh, let's hope we can continue building it. And anybody that wants to help, please, right? Help. All right. Thanks again, everyone. And thanks again, Mark. Okay, bye-bye.